I remember asking my mom one day, are you and dad gonna get divorced? And I don't remember anything specifically happening before that. So there's a shift in the family atmosphere and I definitely felt that. You can't really explain how you're feeling and, and this massive change that's going on in your life if you really don't understand everything. I know people think that children can't understand, but they pick up on everything. The cold shoulders, the tension. Well, kids go through a lot of changes all through their lives until they're adults. And when a family starts to change, the relationships change immediately. Not just between mom and dad, but between mom and the kids or dad and the kids, and certainly between the family members themselves. So when a family goes through breakdown, the changes are enormous and often not understood by the people right in the middle of it. It's important for the child not to know the details of the disagreement or disputes or problems between their parents. You know, that should be the adult's business. On the issue of what should parents tell children, nothing. Nothing about their personal experience, the failure of the marriage. Um, I would go so far as to say shame on the parent that believes they have to set the child straight. It's part of human nature to want to explain to a child, even an adult one, exactly what happened. And this is why you can't blame me for this because, you know, everyone, if someone else in my shoes would do exactly the same thing. Well, I don't want to know the details, really. <laughs> it's enough to know that it's, <laughs> it's being destroyed. There are a number of terrible processes that unfold when you do this. Number one, if one parent says, well, let me tell you what's really going on, the other parent is going to feel compelled to do the same, and the child has to choose which parent is right. And a, cha a child should never have to choose which parent is right. Parents have a tendency of speaking negative um, uh, and, and making the other parent um, almost be alienated to a certain extent. And um, that's not helpful because it takes two parents, whether you're in the same household or not, to um, raise your children. I can distinctly, distinctly remember of times when my mother and my grandmother definitely had negative feelings towards my father and in his side of the family in general. Um, and, I, and I overheard those conversations. And it definitely has an influence on how you feel towards your, um, your, your parents. In divorce, people don't understand when they're being selfish. They think they're being honest. They think they're being truthful. Uh, they think they're telling their side of the story, but sometimes they forget that kids don't need to know each parent's side of the story. They just need to know they're loved and that everything will be okay and that both parents are gonna work together to make sure that happens. One of the biggest no-nos in a divorce, obviously, is putting the children um, in the position of being uh, between the parents in an argument and trying to communicate through the children. And that seems so obvious, and we all know it, and yet parents succumb to it all the time. And it's just, it's just cruel and, and unnecessary. The fact that the parents aren't able to work out their problems directly shouldn't mean that they should put the children in the middle of it. I did feel in the middle, like I was put in the middle sometimes. I I don't think it was in, intentional by any means, but it, I wanted to protect both my mom and my dad. And, you know, I was 12 years old. The roles uh, between my parents shifted where I almost became the parent or the rational one, and my parents uh, became the child, where they would be calling me about problems with each other. and. Unfortunately, at first, I felt the need to try to solve their problems and to try to make things better. Children need to see their parents as pretty strong and successful and able to take care of them. Most of us start seeing our parents as human beings with frailties. Usually the earliest is in the middle 20s, but more realistically, 30s or 40s. Do you really want an 8-year-old to begin to see their parent as a frail human being at 8? 
remember, you're still a parent. You, you haven't switched roles from being mom or dad to now wanting to be your best friend of, of the child. And I think it's important to try to maintain some sort of schedule. Make sure you don't alter their um, body schedule, sleeping and eating and things like that. Help those things to be as stable as possible. Don't change all that for him or her. If they're involved in certain activities, you try to keep them in the activities that they're in. Um, I know a lot of parents want to try to keep their children in the same schools and you know if that's a possibility obviously that's a great thing to do. A lot of parents want to keep the children in the marital residence because that's what they've known and I, and I find that that's helpful for children too who are adjusting. Consistency takes different forms in different families. Kids need to understand what to expect and it really is more about communication. It is incumbent upon parents to make the divorce functional for their child and not the other way around. Well, not only was I trying to deal with my parents fighting and grappling with this new situation and how our family was evolving into these different groups, but then there was another group drawn, another line drawn, so that I didn't even have the support of my extended family. I'm sorry. It's just gets hard to talk about because it's a wound that hasn't healed. But it, there was, people wouldn't talk about it. So we would go to dinners these big family functions with the extended family and half of them wouldn't speak to my mother and as a child as her daughter I wanted to protect her and there wasn't anything I could do but it's not just between mom and dad which a lot of parents think this is just between us no it's really between the whole family, because everybody relies on mom and dad as the foundation of the family. Well, I think a lot of people feel like when they separate from the other parent, they become so interested in keeping the child to themselves and their side of the family that they overlook the fact that children benefit from knowing as many relatives and receiving the love from as many relatives, or not even just relatives, but friends, acquaintances, neighbors, as they possibly can. I really think my dad's side of the family just adored my mom um, and my, my grandmother, his mom, um, my yaya. She, she really missed my mom, really missed my mom. And my dad really missed my mom's side of the family as well. So it, it, it was hard on them too, an extended family. I had so much anxiety um, about my mother and my father being at the wedding because they are still not civil. Um, I was worried about that more than my dress <laughs> and you know everything else. Um, thankfully, it, it turned out smoothly and I asked them to do a favor and just put me first for that day. Um, but, you know, of course, there were still things said, and of course, I found out about them. So, um, yeah, I have extreme anxiety about it, and it's really sad that um, my extended family will probably never see each other, really, so. Nobody likes going to court. Court is ugly. You can smell it as you walk in. The challenge, the trauma, the stress, the no sleeping the night before going to court. So how can parents best deal with court? They can understand that the judge doesn't want to be there either. So you walk into the courtroom and the person that's going to ultimately make the decision as to what happens to your children for potentially the rest of their lives. I mean, the, the decision that's being made about custody is going to impact every facet of, of this child's life for years. And the person making that decision has the least amount of information available. And in court, emotion doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how mad you're at somebody. It's, it's hard numbers, it's allocation of assets, it's division of property, it's, it's visitation and child support. When you 
go to court, you are abdicating your role as a decision maker for the benefit of your kids. You're inviting a judge and the state into your life to hear a few hours of testimony and that judge sits and makes a decision that affects how your children will be parented, when they will be parented and who will be doing the parenting. There is nobody who is more capable of making that decision than parents. To say I'm going to give up control as to what's going to happen to my children to a complete stranger who doesn't know anything about them, doesn't know anything other than what they hear in that courtroom, um, I think is, a, is, is just a, a horrible solution to a difficult problem. And I would have to say that most of the time when people have a contested custody hearing, um, no one really walks out feeling like they won. I've seen more judges say to the clients and the lawyers, why don't you guys go out in the hall and figure this out? And what that is code for is none of you are going to be happy with the decision I make on behalf of your family. Make your own decision. The judge will never know your family the way you and your child's other parent do. If you all can figure out what's best for them, that's what's going to be best for everybody. There are alternatives to litigation, and those involve choices by the parties involved in the family dissolution. The best alternative is, is right at the ground level. If you can sit down, if you can talk with each other, if you can try to work out some sort of agreement, even a base agreement, before you start taking the, uh, the litigation approach, do it. One of the best alternatives that you will find that top divorce lawyers recommend is a marriage counselor. Every good divorce lawyer is going to say, have you seen a marriage counselor? Have you considered counseling? Because your attorney cannot be your counselor. Your attorney can be your lawyer and represent your interests, but he or she cannot be your counselor. And a marriage counselor can do things to help you heal that no one else can do. They feel like they need to see a counselor. They need to see a therapist. A lot of times they're afraid to do it because they say it'll be used against them in a court case. The reality is far from that. You get credit for getting help. You get demerits for behaving badly because you didn't get help. So if you need to see a counselor, you should go. I know when they come to the, the sessions, to the mediations, or even to our parenting class, you know, they, they've, they've, sometimes they've been ordered to come. And so that in itself, you know, they might have a, a feeling of, I don't want to be here because I know best, you know. But a lot of times after they come into the class, they start to settle and understand that, you know, okay, well, it's not about me. It's not about us. It's about making sure that the children are okay. And that's what I always stress to them. Mediation, uh, where you have an unbiased third party, uh, that you can air your concerns and is actually not, doesn't have their hands tied as much as a judge does and can really craft an agreement and an arrangement between the parties that hopefully both would be happy with. There's anything from mediation where you sit down with a mediator and air out all your difficulties and hopefully come to conclusion to collaborative family law where you and your attorney are in a room with your spouse and the other, his attorney, maybe a divorce coach, an accountant, a tax expert that's going to tell you all the ramifications of what's happening here. I've got a case right now where the attorneys have uh, sent the parents to a family specialist. That family specialist is calming everything down. We've got another specialist working with the children. The children's specialist and the parental specialist are coordinating to develop a parenting plan. And it's not as adversarial. Um, when you go into court, you know, you go into win. When you're sitting and doing mediation, you're trying to reach a final product and a goal, but you're doing it together. Um, and I think it really changes the tone of the divorce. I just ask the participants to come into mediation with an open mind, um, to have a willingness to be there, and to um, keep in mind that it is a voluntary process, but with a little bit of effort, it, it's doable. You can make it through that. You know, sometimes uh, I, I find that the parents get so caught up in, in the moment, you know, of what's going on. Um, they'll either put the child, have the child carrying messages, 
um, uh, such as I haven't received my child support, um, you know, things that the child really doesn't need to be involved in. Um, but I, I really, I just strongly believe that if they would just stop for a moment, you know, don't, don't get so caught up that you can't think clearly. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you can do this, you can make this work. The most important thing uh, that any parent can do is never confuse your anger with their, with their mother or father with them. And, and do everything you can to insulate that child from what's going on in the bigger relationship. Unfortunately, divorce seems to make people very selfish and to try not to be selfish, to think about other people and the impacts and the ripple effect that a divorce can cause, not only to your children, but to the rest of your family. Just because they, the divorce is finalized, it doesn't end there. It, it, you know, I've, um, the effects last for years. Make sure you understand what memories are you creating for your children in this process. Um, as I said, I was three when my parents divorced and I remember the day that that uncoupling or my family structure changed and that was well over 50 years ago. Just remember that you can still be a mom, you can still be a dad and a good one. Um, it's not a fight when it comes to your children, even though a lot of people think that that's what it is. Um, maybe you didn't get along as husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend or whatever the case may be, but you can still get along as mom and da dad for these children. And I think that's really what parents have to remember, that that's their role with these children and that they continue to play that role.